Good evening to you, Professor. Thank you very much. Tell us a little bit more about this research. Um, do you already know that um, habits are changing, that humpback whales are under threat, or are you sus suspecting that there are changes that you need to verify? Thank you, Sally, and good evening to all the listeners. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to showcase such an international project. Uh, to go straight to your question, uh, we actually we know that the habitat is changing, and this is uh, not just in the southern hemisphere or in the regions we know, but it's all around the globe. So we have to consider this new normal as many other new normals that we are starting to realize. In, uh, in the recent times. This is, but you need, uh, you need a village actually to understand those kind of things. And that's why we brought together a team of experts from, uh, from three continents all together. Uh, we are particularly interested in the Southern Hemisphere where we know a lot less. So we actually, we don't know that what exactly is going on, but we know that something is changing. New features, new uh, characteristics and behaviors are appearing as we observe. The, the system, the ocean changing. So how are you, you know, there's 25 researchers over six countries, I think it is. How are you, first of all, going to work together, divide up the project, and how are you actually going to carry out the project? What, what do you do? Do you put cameras on whales? <laughs> well, actually, this is, this is, it's not an hyperbole. It is actually a reality. People <laughs> do that. It's not particularly, we got the team of, uh, um, our team of uh, um, South American uh, partners that they are experts in tagging whales mm -hmm. to understand uh, where they move uh, and uh, uh, South African researchers are also doing that. The problem is that humpback whales are migrators, very large migrators. So and it's very hard to connect the regions where they feed with the regions where they breed. So they feed in the southern hemisphere very close to the sea ice and they breed close to our um, to continents and to the three continents you mentioned earlier. But the regions from where they come from during this migration is so vast in the computer sciences. And you need all of them all throughout the world. And that's why, uh, that's exactly what we're doing. But uh, uh, nowadays, we can, you can keep working together from a distance, and that's what you do. Actually, the major problem becomes uh, the time zones, because we are <laughs> separated in three mm. regions. So having a meeting with the Australians, the South African, and the South American is, is practically impossible. Um, <laughs> yeah, really I'm sure. That. That, that's quite a challenge. Tell me something. Are humpback whales actually under threat? Is their population diminishing? We know that in the last century, whaling was a massive problem, and that decimated populations. But are humpback whales actually decreasing? So the, the story of uh, humpback whales is a story of um, ocean conservation success. Um, we had uh, uh, some 200,000 humpback whales uh, that have been killed by modern uh, whaling in, uh, in uh, the past century. And since uh, the banning, since the secession of, uh, of whaling, there has been an incredible recovery of this population. Now, the problem is that uh, the current recovery of this population is now exposed to new challenges. And honestly, we don't know these new challenges because the population was never so big. So it's, we are dealing now with a population that is growing and is dealing with the other problems that other uh, nature populations in the world, in the ocean, are facing, like changes in the distribution of surface temperature. Take into uh, consideration that for breeding, and this is the reason why they are actually changing their aerial distribution, their regional distribution, is that for breeding, they have to look for a certain temperature of the water. They don't feed during this particular phase of their life cycle, but they need a certain temperature to, to go there. And that's why we see them migrating towards the equator during, the, du during the, the breeding season. But for feeding, they need to get to be closer to the ice, where you have the upwelling of cold waters and nutrient-rich waters with all the krill, which is the major food for whales. So this means that now we have to restart thinking of, uh, about humpback whales. And there's a, a group of people all around the world that is very interested in that. And our project is trying to combine all this knowledge together. So it's really kind of like a bit of a detective mission. You can see their changes. You want to protect this population that has managed to rebound so well after whaling. Um, do you have any hunches as to who the culprits might be? And is it an obvious one as 
possibly climate change? Well, that's the obvious one. Mm. The problem in the southern hemisphere is that uh, uh, the ocean, the sea ice, the habitats where these animals are living are actually very variable. We don't have a sufficiently long history to understand what's going on and what kind of surprises and whether actually the, the climate is, is effectively modifying. We do know that the climate is climate change is doing something and there are new behaviors also coming out. One example is, for instance, the very recent finding of aggregations of humpback whales all around uh, the Western Cape. This occurred, this started to occur in 2015. Our partner, uh, Professor Findlay from, from uh, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology uh, found these aggregations of more than 100 individuals. This is a totally new behavior that was never observed before. So it may be, and this is part of the study we are doing with the postdocs at the University of Cape Town together with all the other partners, is whether what changed in the, in the last five years, if there has been any kind of regime shift in the typical conditions of this region. So it's very much a detective story, and we have to hunt this all around the world, and not just in, in corners or in certain rooms, as <laughs> detectives used to. And, and how long have you got to solve this mystery? <laughs> well, a lifetime is probably not enough, and that's why you need several lifetimes all, uh, all together. Um, we are very grateful to a charitable foundation for uh, providing us the funding to do this study. We started a couple of years ago. Uh, to, to, to get the, the ball running, and now we are expanding. We hope that in a two to three years, we will be able to disentangle at least a few of the major, more pressing issues. I mean, this population has been affected largely by the whaling. And um, let me tell you one thing. Uh, uh, it's a paradox, but actually it's very... The whaling is helping us to understand how climate models are working because we know climate models are helping us to shape the future scenarios what would happen in the, in the, uh, uh, in the future uh, based on our lifestyles and socioeconomical changes but we don't know whether they are good at predicting the last century because we didn't have measurements now the whaling is giving us an opportunity to understand where the sea ice was at uh, the beginning of the 19th century, in the 1930s, because the whalers were actually there catching whales. And that's an indication of where the sea ice was. And actually, one of our students, Tanda Mazomba from UCT, is doing her MSc particularly on this. And this will uh, guide mm. the design of better climate huh. models for our future. So there's clues from the past as well. It's completely fascinating. And thank you so much uh, for giving us a peek into the world of the humpback whale. That was Professor Marcello Vicky, director of UCT's Marine Research Institute.